Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, producer and host. First up on this episode, we'll be covering the Raise the Wage Act, a bill that passed the U.S. House on July 18, which would double federal minimum wage by the year 2025. Those in support of the bill say that it would increase pay for 27 million workers and left over 1 million people out of poverty. But those opposed to the bill say it would have the exact opposite effect, causing one million people to lose their jobs. So which is it? Dave Hebert, a professor of economics at Aquinas College, joins me to explain the economics behind the issue and what real effects the bill would have. After that, we examine the benefits and drawbacks of social media with Glenn Harlan Reynolds, a professor of law at the University of Tennessee and the author of the new book, The Social Media Upheaval. Social media, and especially Twitter, is increasingly dominating journalism and politics, and we're just beginning to understand how it affects our minds. In this segment, we look at proposals for social media regulation. How can we reduce the toll of social media while also respecting free speech? To dive deeper into the topics on this episode, I've linked articles, videos, and extra resources in the show notes, posted every Wednesday when our episodes release at blog.actin.org. If you like this podcast, don't forget to leave a rating and review on iTunes. And as always, don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. On July 18, the U.S. House passed the Raise the Wage Act, which would raise the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour by 2025 and would also end sub-minimum wage for tipped workers. Members of Congress say that this bill will lift 1.3 million people out of poverty and raise annual earnings by 2,800 for 27 million people. Today to talk with me about this issue is Dave Hebert, who is a professor of economics at Aquinas College. Dave, thank you for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. So when you hear that these promises are being made by government Mm -hmm. about the effects that raising the minimum wage would have, are there alarms going off in your head? Because that's that's a lot being promised by the government, 1.3 million people being raised out of poverty and raising annual earnings by 2,800 for 27 million people. I mean, that sounds too good to be true. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's one of those things where uh, the, the language of this law sounds absolutely wonderful. You know, who could possibly argue against paying workers more money? Uh, and who could argue against the idea that making seven fifty dollars an hour, and, and, which is an effective annual salary of about 15000 a year, you know, who could argue that that's a, a low amount to be paid? So, yeah, there's, there's tremendous sort of moral thinking about this that, that sounds wonderful. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the economic analyses and, and empirics come out and say that this is a terrible idea. So the CBO just released a study on this exact bill saying that somewhere between 1.3 and 3.7 million jobs would disappear as a result of this act. So it's it's hard to say that, you know, yeah, there'll be some winners. There sure could be, you know, 1.6 or some odd million people that benefit from it. But it seems odd to say to somewhere between one and almost four million people that they have to not work now in order to help one point some odd million people live a marginally better life. Even $15 an hour is only 30000 a year. So it's not like we're talking about a huge, you know, salary. Right. And I mean, it's just, I mean, that's a huge gamble to take is basically what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. So one of my, um, one of my favorite parts of this is, is if you pull... Uh, American economists, and and economists are famous for disagreeing. You know, there's the old joke that uh, if you lined up all the economists in the world, they still wouldn't reach a consensus. Well, on the issue of the minimum wage, 90% of economists agree that this is a bad idea. And that's that's something that I think we should take notice of. I mean, if economists, the the people that, you know, I think it was Richard Nixon once said, just give me a one-handed economist when he was frustrated at the fact that we can can say, you know, on the one hand, this will be great, and on the other hand, this will be bad. You know, we have a group that's famous for just disagreeing with each other constantly. But now 90% of us agree that this is a terrible idea. Now, the last time that the federal minimum wage was increased was in 2009, and 10 years is the longest we've gone without a raise at the federal level. Do you think that we're due for an increase at all, or are you against raising it across the board? 
Yeah, I'd be against raising it across the board. So there's there's two things to kind of think about. So one is this is is not actually the longest time we've gone without raising the minimum wage. The first minimum wage was enacted in 1935. So we started with an almost 100-year history of no minimum wage and then had one, right? So that's a much longer period than 10 years. Uh, but the other side of it is to think about what are some of the effects of this, okay? And one of the, the hallmarks of economics is to think about costs and benefits. Anytime you raise the cost of something, whether it's coffee from Starbucks or Chick-fil-A sandwiches or labor, anytime that cost goes up, people will buy less of it. In the market for labor, that means that less people get jobs. That sounds like a terrible idea. What we've seen in places that have raised the minimum wage, so there are multiple minimum wages. There's the federal and there's individual states that have minimum wages. In areas where individual states or individual cities have raised the minimum wage, what we've seen is a rapid increase in substituting technology for workers. So if you go to a fast food restaurant, for example, you might see um, instead of a cashier, you might see a giant touch screen where you get to actually touch the order and make it exactly how you want. And then someone dispassionately yells out a number and you pick up your food. Well, that's a form of substituting machinery or capital for labor. We also see the self-checkout lines at the grocery store. What used to take four people to run a checkout line can now be done with just one person supervising four, maybe even six or ten separate cash registers that you work on your own. So what we see is, is companies finding ways to avoid having to hire workers. And it's especially concentrated in minimum wage jobs and in places with high minimum wages. I want to start from the beginning of the issue uh, at the foundation or the economics 101 of the issue. What are the biggest misconceptions about minimum wage? Yeah, so the big misconception is that there aren't going to be trade-offs. Everyone seems to think that if you just magically wave this magic wand called, you know, the president's uh, pen or Congress's assent or Congress's approval, if you just wave that magic wand, then everything is going to be changed for the better. And that's just not true. Things have unintended consequences, and these are never more clear than they are with minimum wage legislation. The unintended consequences uh, tend to be concentrated among the economically destitute, so the poor, or what economists typically call, admittedly very dispassionately, the low-skilled workers. These are the people that are affected most directly by minimum wage, and they're the people that we're trying to help. You know, there's no dispute that, like I said earlier, making fifteen or thirty thousand dollars a year is difficult. That's a financially hard life. But we need to be very careful when we try to help people and make sure that we're not actually hurting them. Here, if we look at some of the data for minimum wage workers, only about 2% of the entire minimum wage earning population is under the age of, I'm sorry, is over the age of 24. That means that 98% of minimum wage workers are college age and younger. Now, it's no crime to be a college student or a high school student earning minimum wage. You likely have very few bills to pay. Right? You're living with mom and dad or you're in college basically just making some extra money on the side to buy your textbooks or you know, put gas in your car so you can go home and visit your family. Right? That's not something that I think we should really worry about. What we should worry about is the disappearing of those types of jobs that college students and young people can sort of start their careers on. This sets people up for failure. When you don't get to have that first job, that's when people have a really hard time getting sort of the second job, the job that pays enough that they can be on their career path, that they can go forth and do you know, what they're passionate about. Um, and so removing that first opportunity, which is typically what happens when we raise the minimum wage, is people don't get to have that first job and have that job experience. It means there's a big blank on their resume when they walk out of college. So they have this fancy degree, but they have no experience. You're not going to have a good time getting a job. Now, if you went to, say, Harvard, yeah, you're going to find a job, no problem. But for the vast majority of college students who don't go to Harvard or MIT or these Ivy League schools, this is, makes it just that much harder to start your life. 
You said earlier that 90% of economists are generally in agreement with you about this against raising the minimum wage at the federal level. But for the 10% of economists who would support raising it, what motivates their economic perspective on this? Why would they support it? Yeah, so the minimum wage is, is a tough one. And it's one of those topics that we teach in Econ 101 that says, hey, if you raise the minimum wage or any type of what we call a price floor, uh, that will cause the quantity supplied to exceed the quantity demanded. And we call that difference a uh, surplus. And in the labor market, that's referred to as unemployment. It basically says there's a lot of people that will want a job and very few jobs that exist. So this Econ 101 insight is, is one of the most popular things to try to empirically test. The challenge is to control for all the multiple margins upon which employers could adjust. So I'll give myself as an example since I'm most familiar with myself. So I teach at Aquinas College. Um, I get several, I get a salary, but I also get paid in other ways. So I get a free faculty parking pass. So I walk into the campus security office and they just give me a sticker that I can put on my car and I can park wherever I want. I get uh, with it. My child is unborn yet, but is coming in three weeks. So we're excited and terrified of that. Uh, but if they decide that they want to go to Aquinas, they can go for free. That's part of how I get paid is if my child wants to go to Aquinas College, their tuition is waived. What would happen if a minimum wage forced Aquinas to pay me more dollars than they currently are is those types of benefits would go away or would be greatly reduced. So I might have to pay for my faculty parking spot. I might have to pay to send my kid to college. And so, you know, these are real things that matter. You know, we might quibble and say, you know, God forbid you have to pay for your parking pass, which I agree, not the end of the world. But these are other forms of how I am paid. And so if your employer is able to reduce sort of these other forms of compensation, so in the restaurant industry, maybe if you work a full shift, you get a free meal or maybe two free meals or free soda all day, right? If you take those away, well, suddenly the employer is now saving money on your employment and can pay you more dollars. So part of the challenge of analyzing minimum wage legislation is trying to control for all the unobservable but very real forms of compensation that employers offer. So you might see less unemployment than predicted, you might even see none. So let's say Michigan raised the minimum wage to $200 an hour. I'm willing to bet that everyone that doesn't make $200 an hour right now would move out of the state. And so that would mean that the unemployment rate in Michigan would actually go down because we'd have fewer people counting as unemployed. So it's very difficult to analyze the effect of minimum wage legislation on unemployment and control for all the things that you have to control for mm -hmm. to get your analysis correct. Which is why it's so dangerous to set it at right. the federal level. It's very dangerous to set it at the federal level. It's, it's a one-size-fits-all policy that forces 50 very unique states and countless cities to comply with a one-size-fits-all policy. That's a very difficult thing to do. So one aspect of this that I think is important that we should also dive into is kind of the moral side of this conversation, because on the left, I would say, um, or people who are in support of raising the minimum wage, it is such a moral issue to them because it to them, it signifies moving people out of poverty. Right. Um, Pelosi said on the floor before, before the House voted on the bill um, that, quote, today we wake up for a day of jubilation because of the sense of fairness this legislation engenders, showing the world with all the love in our hearts. And that love in our hearts is about fairness for the American people, unquote. Yeah. <laughs> so when we talk about the use of the words like fairness and love here, I mean, she's basically implying that people who aren't in in support of raising the minimum wage are you don't want fairness, uh, right. don't have love in their hearts. She's basically just adding fuel to the fire of our really polarized public discourse. I mean, yeah. how do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. We currently today, I think we are the most politically polarized we've ever been. And it's, it's so much a, a team red versus team blue type of mentality in, in the U.S. today that, you know, if you're on Team Blue, anyone who is Team Red is obviously evil to you. And that's really sad to me. We've lost the insight that basically to oppose any policy doesn't mean that you oppose the goals. So, for example, I oppose the Affordable Care Act. 
Does that mean that I want low-income people to not have health care? Of course not. I want everyone to have health care. No one in, in America, at least I think, wants people to live poor, to live destitute, course, to live paycheck yeah. to paycheck. That's just not true. You might argue, and I think this is where people who oppose the minimum wage come from, you might argue that you know, we share the same common goal, lifting people out of poverty. The question is whether or not this particular policy will do that. To that, that's a big question, and it's an important one. Mm -hmm. But to say that people who oppose the policy are therefore evil, that's just a huge – it's just not true. Mm -hmm. it's a, that's a lie on stilts. Um, and so I would try to push back, and I think this is a big failure of economists today is, is you know, we know that this happens. We've failed to communicate that to the American public and to the world public because America is not alone in having a minimum wage. We've failed to communicate just how disastrous this actually is. And so we need to do a better job at, at communicating that, yes, we want to help people. That's our goal. We all share the common goal of helping people. Even the socialists wanted to help people. They're not evil. The capitalists want to help people, too. They're not evil either. The question is, how do we get from where we are to a place that's better? And that's a big, important question. But we're not arguing about the end goal. I want people to live healthily, wealthily, and as happily as they possibly can, however they choose to define those things. But I also oppose the minimum wage because I don't think it's going to get there. All right. Well, Dave, thank you so much for coming in and talking with me today. Yeah. Thank you again for having me. For over 29 years, Acton Institute has worked to connect economic freedom, free enterprise, and entrepreneurship with a vibrant Judeo-Christian moral culture. In addition to demands for limited government and lower taxes, Acton believes that liberty is best preserved when man's God-given dignity is recognized and respected. Only when our rights are rooted in something deeper are they absolutely secure. Please join friends and supporters of Acton on Wednesday, September 4 in Pittsburgh at the Duquesne Club for a dinner and a special keynote address by president and co-founder of Acton, Reverend Robert Sirico. Save your seat before they're all gone at acton.org slash events. Welcome to Acton Line. I'm your host, John Caritas. Today we're talking with Glenn Harlan Reynolds, a professor of law at the University of Tennessee and a blogger at the indispensable instapundit.com. Glenn's op-eds are published widely in such publications as Forbes, Wall Street Journal, and USA Today. He lives in Knoxville, Tennessee. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Glenn. Great to be here. You have a timely new book out from Encounter titled The Social Media Upheaval. Uh, but before we get into the book, I have a, a confession of sorts. A couple years ago now, I exterminated all of my Facebook friends. You might uh, call it a virtual crime against humanity. <laughs> I just couldn't take it anymore. The manufactured outrage, the memes, the links, the videos coming rapid fire, both from the left and the right, from so-called friends. And But you just knew that most of these people hadn't even bothered to actually go to the links and search for evidence behind all of the outrage. So um, now I just follow groups, baseball, hockey, fishing, cigars, and Facebook has never been more congenial, I have to say. So you get into this in your excellent new book. You describe how social media platforms are actually engineered for what you call viruses of the mind, which spread in much the same way as a plague would have spread through medieval cities. In another place, you describe it as an out-of-control nuclear reaction when the rods get pulled out for too long. I'm big on, my, I'm big on the tech metaphors. <laughs> yes, you are, yeah. And you talk about how th these platforms work in just the way they were engineered to do. And does that explain a lot of what's going on right now? I think it really does. I mean, I'll back up a little and tell you, uh, the viruses of the mind idea is certainly not original with me. I think it started with Richard Dawkins in The Selfish Gene back in the 70s uh, when he wrote that, you know, a, a gene is just an idea that is embodied in DNA that uses uh, others to reproduce itself. And he said there are ideas that use other minds to reproduce themselves, which he called memes. And that's the original meaning of meme before it became associated with pictures of cats with funny captions. Uh, and what... What I was actually doing when, when the idea for this book popped into my head 
is I was reading a book by James Scott, who's a really interesting scholar at Yale, called Against the Grain, A Deep History of the Early States. And it's about the very first cities uh, which would appear and become surprisingly big and prosperous with thousands or even sometimes more than 10,000 people. But then after a generally pretty short period, they would just depopulate. Everyone would run away. Uh, and the reason was disease. And nobody knew anything about disease back then. And you would take a bunch of people and their animals and cram them together into a small space, which had never happened before. Uh, and suddenly these diseases that had been no issue when people were hunting and gathering uh, would spread like wildfire and depopulate the town overnight. And there was this line in his book. He said, the pioneers who created this historically novel ecology could not possibly have known the disease vectors they were inadvertently unleashing. And then right after that, I read this. Uh, it was actually a tweet by Richard Fernandez. He said, the Internet is rewiring brains and social relations. Could it be producing a civilizational nervous breakdown? And it occurred to me that you know, toxic thoughts and bad ideas and mass hysteria have, have always been around. Uh, but we have actually kind of by design created a mechanism to make them spread quickly and to undermine a lot of things that would ordinarily tend to keep them in check or damp them out. Uh, the social media platforms are uh, quite literally designed to promote the spread of emo negative emotions. They're designed to produce engagement, which means amplifying emotional reactions. And as Jaron Lanier pointed out in, in a book he had on social media recently, the easiest emotions to amplify are the negative ones. So it's not a surprise that the more time people spend on social media, generally the angrier and sadder they tend to become. Well, yeah, it's uh, the more alarming it is, the quicker it grabs your attention. And you, you talk about how not only has the speed of transmission uh, ratcheted up, but this interaction, as you just described it, has also really uh, become a much more rapid. Yeah, well, the, the thing about it is the old blogosphere, the transmission was the same speed, roughly the speed of light on the Internet, uh, but the interaction was, by modern standards, slow, because if you wanted to blog about something, you had to read it, think about it, and actually write a post and hit publish. Uh, we thought that was really fast in, say, 2001, but by comparison to hitting a like or retweet button, it was very slow. Uh, and the blogosphere was sort of a loosely coupled system. Uh, you couldn't see what was on a blog unless you went there. It wasn't presented in your face. Uh, if you didn't like what a blogger had to say, you just didn't go to their site. Uh, Social media have a common channel, and they're tightly coupled. They're more like the old use net, really. A tightly coupled system is where what happens in one part of it tends to rapidly affect the rest of it. Uh, and uh, the common channel is, you know, trolls can get in your face. Yeah, well, the blog requires, if it's not just a quick snip and run, a, a modicum of thought and a little research, put a link or two in there, whereas the the social media approach really is what uh, creates this mob mentality, I think, uh, as you describe it in the, in the book, whereas this instantaneous outrage and the way the technology can bring everyone to a single tweet um, in force is really much different than the blogs or the, or the message boards, which, you know, they had their flames and that sort of thing, but not at this pace, I don't think. So the research shows that most people don't even read the underlying story when they share or retweet uh, a story on social media. They respond entirely to the headline, which is generally designed to be more inflammatory than the story, um, so as to be clickbait. And it, it's actually interesting at a lot of platforms, and this is certainly true with one I'm associated with, PJ Media, when you're an editor and you're getting ready to post a story, they actually draft like five different headlines for it. And then those five headlines get sent to the Amazon Mechanical Turk service, where people who are being paid a small amount of money uh, answer which one they would be more likely to click on, and then that becomes the headline for the piece. And it's all an automated process. It just takes a couple of seconds uh, when the story is published. But that's designed to produce maximum engagement in the news. So inflammatory headlines uh, are also part of the process. <laughs> so it's all, it's and it all works. Let's face it, it works out there with what – people are looking for right now. It, it, it totally does. And, um, you know, maybe one day people will be so sick of inflammatory headlines that they'll actually preferentially click on boring ones with things like worthwhile <laughs> Canadian initiative just to avoid the stimulation. But right. I doubt it. Right. Well, that's what that's what finally I had to throw the towel in myself. I couldn't 
couldn't take it because I had to sift through all this stuff before I found something that was interesting. So, well, it is you know it's absolutely the case that these uh, systems are designed to do that, and they're designed to do that because it makes people money. And the social media companies, uh, well, I wouldn't say they're out deliberately to undermine society and people's mental state. They don't really mind, and they. You know, they try to make their sites addictive using the same kind of techniques that, like, casinos use. And one of my favorite little tidbits is one of the companies that consults on how to make your app more addictive uh, is called Dopamine Labs. I mean, they're not making any bones <laughs> about what they do. Right. Uh, so, so that's bad for people. Uh, and that's, that's the environment we have. It's one that is, you know, by design, really, spreads toxic, upsetting, angry ideas uh, with very little thought or reflection. And unsurprisingly, people are now angrier. I mean, I, I say, you know, the, the breakout quote in the back of my book is, society seems to be growing steadily crazier. And maybe it doesn't just seem to be. Maybe it actually is growing crazier. And, you know, as you describe it, it's not necessarily politically motivated, although that's certainly a byproduct. It's like, if this stuff works, and we can monetize it, and we get more and more people clicking on this or that, hey, we're successful. And um, the fallout is probably less of interest to someone trying to do a, a dopamine type uh, technology widget. Yeah, I mean, you've got, you, you also have the undeniable fact that the tech companies aren't diverse at all and, in fact, lean pretty hard, crazy left. And you only have to look at some of the stuff that's come out of the Google employees message boards and stuff lately to see that. And Jack Dorsey, the uh, CEO of Twitter, admits that his company is overwhelmingly leftist and that their few conservative employees are afraid to even let people know that, that they're conservatives. Uh, that's, a, that's a problem of a different order. But even if these sites were run by completely neutral, impartial people who had no politics at all, they would still be destructive. Yeah, and you may have seen the um, clips or highlights from the Senate hearing, I think it was in June, where Senator Ted Cruz was grilling a Google exec because, again, there was some leaked information that came out. And a yet another separate Google exec uh, was telling people how she loves Elizabeth Warren, but she's misguided about breaking up big tech. And then she was emphasizing the fact that smaller companies who don't have the same resources that we, as Google does, will be charged with preventing the next Trump situation. So things like that just uh, alarm people who don't share this hard left orientation in the tech sector and raises questions about antitrust enforcement. Well, well, yes. I mean, there, there, there's two different problems antitrust-wise here. and Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but problem number one is each of these companies acts as a semi-monopoly in its particular field. Google has tremendous uh, control over advertising and search. Uh, Facebook has tremendous control over social media. And, you know, and so on down the line, YouTube controls video. It's owned by Google, too. Uh, so that's problem number one. Problem number two is that these companies have, have been visibly colluding to disadvantage new competitors to the field. So, for example, there's a Twitter competitor called Gab, and PayPal uh, blocked payments to Gab. Uh, there's a YouTube competitor called BitChute, and PayPal blocked payments to BitChute. Now, there's another YouTube competitor called Vimeo, and it's become so docile in the face of this that when uh, James O'Keefe had undercover video of Google executives bragging about how they were going to affect the election, uh, not only did Google get it taken down from YouTube, which Google owns, but Vimeo just went ahead and took it down, too, I think as a courtesy to Google. Uh, so there's a lot of collusion that I think needs to be policed uh, in this area. And, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, competition will fix this. Nobody can keep a monopoly going. Uh, you keep a monopoly going for a long time if other companies uh, cooperate with you and to starve competitors of capital and access. Right. And they're snapping up every little startup that seems to um, have some competitive promise in their area. And so... Uh, there's more and more concentration of this type of technology. Now, you're a law professor, so I want to get into this a little deeper um, on the antitrust question. You say that government policing of content at the granular, granular level, you know, what people are saying about X and Y, uh, raises questions of free speech. Uh, 
but that policing platforms, as we just talked about, and collusion, as you just described, is likely to do more good than censorship. So if, do I understand that correctly? And then yes. how would that work? How do you use um, antitrust laws to prevent this sort of thing that you just described? Well, one of the reasons that censorship and other bad conduct by uh, social media platforms is so damaging is that it's, it covers such a large area. Uh, if Facebook censors you, I mean, yes, there are theoretically some Facebook competitors you could get on instead, like MeWe or something, uh, but you're essentially frozen out of a lot. If Twitter kicks you off, you're essentially frozen out of that kind of social media. Uh, breaking them up so that each area has several competitors would not only mean that nobody gets frozen out completely, but it would also mean that uh, they would actually start competing with each other uh, for free speech, presumably. They would start losing subscribers if people worried about being cut off too much uh, to some similar competing service. Right now, there is no similar competing service to lose people to. So by, by using these laws, then you constrain them from this sort of collusion and you open an avenue for competitors and, again, uh, under the law, they wouldn't be throttling their uh, payment systems or their way they can monetize right. their system. I, I will stress there's another level of this beyond antitrust, uh, which I understand the and, – and the Justice Department is quite interested in the antitrust stuff. Now, the head of the antitrust division gave a speech about six or eight weeks ago uh, in which he espoused what was surprisingly close to my theory. Uh, and, and so I think there is some movement going to happen there. But the other thing that's going on is – there are civil rights conspiracy statutes, both civil and criminal, uh, penalizing people for conspiring to deprive other people of their civil rights. I think you can make a strong argument that when people or companies get together to silence someone based on their speech, that that violates those statutes and opens them up to civil damages and potentially criminal prosecution. These laws were designed to uh, go after the Ku Klux Klan primarily, uh, but the language of the statutes is quite broad, and I think the only reason it hasn't been used yet is that nobody's tried. So that's a limiting limiting of free speech uh, problem uh, under that law. Um, it's a, if it's a conspiracy to silence people's free speech, yes, it's a it's a conspiracy to deprive people of civil rights. More and more, it looks like that. I mean, the, the examples just seem to pile up every day. You can go to Instant Pundit and find them. You get up in the morning and find uh, things like uh, Dennis Prager is now complaining that Google is banning some of his YouTube videos or at least putting them under uh, uh, restrictions for viewing filters, including some of his videos on the Ten Commandments. So I guess now we should consider, the, call them the controversial Ten Commandments uh, <laughs> going forward. Let's shift gears a little bit. I want to talk, if we could, uh, about how Twitter in particular has changed how journalism is done, and how political elites, pundits, uh, the intelligentsia, if we could use that word, uh, nomenclatura uh, in a larger sense, seem to be on Twitter all the time, and it seems to amplify things that really don't wouldn't have normally wound up to be much, but the way Twitter is engineered, it tends to stir the pot quite a bit. It's changed journalism. I mean, now you get stories in, in websites and papers that are basically compilations of tweets. It's like, you know, don't you call anyone or go see them anymore? You just have one tweet after another. Talk a little bit about how it's changed how we, how we understand political culture in our nation. Daniel Borston wrote a book called The Image about journalism back in like the early 60s. And uh, the point of his book then was that journalists are lazy and rather than actually calling people and doing interviews and researching archives, they're usually happy just to publish whatever's put in front of them. In the old days, they at least might have to go down to the press club to take the press releases out of the rack <laughs> where they were. But now you can do a story based on Twitter, and you can create a phony controversy. of some, some celebrity does or says something, five people on Twitter complain, and your story says, Internet reacts in horror to so-and-so, right. you know. Uh, so it's perfect. I mean, you, you don't have to call anybody. The quotes are already right there. It's, it's perfect for being lazy. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that something that has happened to our elites in general, and especially to our journalists in the last few decades, is they have started focusing more on 
performing for their peer group and chasing a reputation among their peer group as opposed to doing their actual jobs. You can be a CEO of a company, and the CEO, the company can be doing badly, but if you're making public statements and taking sort of symbolic actions that play well with other uh, rich, generally liberal people, you'll be considered a, a successful CEO. Uh, this is a phenomenon normally found in middle school girls, uh, but it has now broken out. And actually, the other place it's found, I should say, as a professor, is this is how academics are. Academia runs by reputation. And academia has, for many decades, cared more about people's reputations than about how well, say, they teach their classes. Uh, but it's not, it's not a good look, and it's not a functional way to run a society over time. Uh, but it's absolutely what's wrong now. Yeah, and it sort of flows out of that whole journalist phenomenon where, hey, let's all get our talking points together, almost in a way that politicians will get talking points, only on the journalist side it's – don't we all agree here that this is the right way to look at this? And then um, get yourself outside of that, and uh, the shame mobs will descend on you and the stones will start flying and you'll be cast out. Well, that's absolutely right. And it's interesting for the journalists, the beauty of it is they used to have to have a secret email list to get their talking points together. Now they all just read each other's tweets and, and you know they can, they can get their story together without uh, uh, exactly conspiring. It's more sort of monkey see, monkey do. So maybe we could wrap up a bit here uh, with you gazing into your crystal ball and how, how far is this going to go, the insanity, before finally there's some sort of either legal action or maybe the, the culture underneath these platforms starts to shift and people walk away from them. How is this going to go in the next two or three years? Do you have an idea? I don't know. It's already gotten worse than I thought it was. So I don't know if that's a sign that we're closer to yeah, I know. change or not. Uh, my prediction is that at least through the 2020 elections, it will continue to get crazier. Uh, and I had thought that after the 2016 elections, things would get less crazy, and that wasn't the case. Uh, so I, I really don't know. But what I do know is that uh, there's a real generational shift. I mean, I, you say you quit a lot of stuff on Facebook. Uh, I quit Twitter about a year ago, actually partly as a result of some of the research I was doing on this book. And, you know, I look at my students and people like my daughter's age who are younger, uh, they are much less active on social media and much more basically afraid of social media. You know, 10 years ago or so when Facebook was new, uh, social media was a place for young people. And the young people are not nearly as active now. And in fact, if you look at you know, who's on Twitter and uh, Facebook, it tends to be people in their 40s and 50s. Uh, and in fact, they're losing they're losing users, they're losing revenues, and uh, you know they they may peter out uh, or at least lose the kind of power that they seem to have had. All the best. Uh, the downside of Twitter, in particular, is even if most people aren't on it, and most people aren't, uh, the intelligentsia, the political class, uh, the people who sort of the mood for the country as a whole uh, are still on it, and they seem to be getting crazier all the time. Uh, as long as they're on Twitter, I think it will continue to do damage no matter how small its user base becomes. Yeah, and I think the next year into 2020, the election season will bring in a whole new sort of crazy, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. We've been talking today with Glenn Harlan Reynolds, author of the new book, Highly Recommended, The Social Media Upheaval. Glenn, thanks for coming on the podcast. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening today. If you're interested in learning more about the topics in today's show, I've linked all the articles, books, and more that were mentioned in the show notes, and those are published at blog.acton.org. Here at Acton, our podcast team is working hard to make a great show for you every week, but we couldn't do it without you. Help us make an even better podcast and reach us at actonline at acton.org. This episode is produced and edited by me, Caroline Roberts, with audio mixing by Doug Nagel.